Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about generating a genetically modified organism following a scheme where we were extracting the uh, gene from the host and the we are digesting it with the resection enzymes and at the same time we are also processing the transforming units with the similar kind similar set of resection enzymes and then we are putting these two uh, for ligations and subsequent to that ligation we were putting it into the transformations and uh, after the transformation we are doing the screening and post screening we were getting the positive clones and these positive clones are supposed to produce the protein from the genetically modified organisms and these proteins or the other products are going to be economically useful for downstream applications. So now today's lecture we are going to discuss about how the genetic engineering is going to help the uh, society and as well as what are the different applications in which the genetic engineering can be used. So, as, as I said the genetic engineering has an application in a vast variety of areas whether it is the agriculture or pisciculture or poultry, vaccine, transgenic animals, uh, medicines or we are uh, whether it is in the application of drug delivery. Moreover, we have already discussed about how to generate the genetically modified organisms. So, you can see that genetic engineering has lot of applications in diversified fields and now today on uh, we are going to discuss about how the genetic engineering can be used for making an application in the plant sciences. So, in the case of plant sciences, the genetic engineering in the plant sciences can be used in different fields. For example, when before the molecular techniques are known, the people are using the grafting techniques to generate the different types of species or different types of varieties of the plant. In these grafting techniques, what people are using is they were going with the their own observation that some species are giving good product or good quality whereas some products are actually robust in terms of the disease resistance. So, what they were doing is they were using the grafting techniques and grafting the good product yielding uh, twing onto the disease resistance plants. So, you can see that the cutting, uh, cutting, layering, mound layering, air layering and all these are the grafting techniques which people have used until they were not having the uh, techniques as well as the ability to modify the, uh, the same plant in such a way so that it is going to have the uh, different types of features or different types of acquired uh, characters. Uh, so, uh, and then once they were having the uh, ability to, gen to generate or to perform the molecular biology techniques, they could be able to generate the transgenic plants and then with the help of transgenic plants, they were having the potential to produce the plants which are having the insect control, which means they are going to be having the plants which are insect resistance plants, herbicide resistance plants or the disease resistant plants and at the end they are also having the plant which were resistance against the abiotic stresses. Abiotic stresses means the very high temperature, abiotic means the stresses which are being experienced by the plant by the environmental factors such as the low level of water or high temperature or uh, high heat and all other kind of uh, uh, environmental factors. So, with the help of transgenic plants or with the help of the genetic engineers to uh, generate the transgenic plant, they could be able to produce the plants which could be able to withstand the abiotic stresses also. And then they with the help of gen, uh, the developing development of technique of plant tissue culture, they could be able to utilize this particular technique to generate the new plants. So, in today's lecture we are not going to discuss about the grafting techniques because the grafting technique does not require the genetic engineering and it is actually more of a uh, ancient techniques to generate the newer species. In today's lecture we are going to only discuss about how the development of transgenic plant has 
help the uh, agriculture field and also about the plant tissue culture. So, one of the prime objective of the generation of transgenic plants or uh, one of the major reason why the different types of crops are going to be destroyed because the lot of insects are available which are actually feeding on these plants and one of the prime objective is to control the insects and the control of insect is on the two side. One, you can actually reduce the number of insects which are present or you can actually make the plant resistance for the uh, insect bite. So, in this case what people are doing is they are generating the sterile male insects which means that under the normal natural conditions you have a male insect, you have a female insect and these two male and female insects when they are mating they are producing lot of in offsprings and that is how they are actually increasing the populations. But what you can do is somehow if you can convert a male into the sterile male which means if you can generate the male in such a way that if the male is being produced it is going to be a sterile whereas the female can be a non-sterile. So, in that case what will happen is if the female is sterile it is not going to be mate with the female insects and when since they cannot be able to mate they will not be able to produce their offspring and as a result in due course there will be a decrease in their populations. So, this idea the is that in the in which the mechanism of reducing the number of insect in the affected area through the use of sterile male insects. In a typical insect life cycle male and female mate with each other to produce large number of fertilized eggs and these fertilized eggs actually produces large number of offsprings. So, eggs goes through a series of double stages to produce large number of baby insects to continue. In this approach male insects are exposed to the radiation or other treatment in the laboratory to render them the in sterile or infertile. So, this uh, what people are doing is they are actually exposing the male uh, insects to a radiation or some other kind of chemical treatments and because of that the male is losing its ability to become too fertile. These sterile males insects are spread over the infected area. In this field the female mate female when they mate with these sterile males but no offspring is produced. As a result over the course of time the insect population will be reduced. The classical example of this approach is eradication of the ball wheel, an insect which is responsible for the loss of cotton crops in USA. So, this particular type of idea is already been tested in the USA and the people have found that if you generate the uh, sterile male which is actually incapable of uh, doing the uh, mating with the female in the in due course this kind of population is going to be down. But as a side effect what will happen is that since you have generated the sterile male it is very difficult to predict if this sterile male is not going to transfer its genetic material or if in some cases what people are also trying to do is they are actually making a genetically modified male which is actually the normal but when it is mate with the female and if that mating of with female is producing the male uh, insects those male insects and male offsprings are sterile. So, in those kind of conditions what happen is you do not know if the uh, if the male male uh, insect is going to transmit the, that particular information with the other kind of insects. For example, if they transmit that to other insects which are actually important for pollination because insects are actually feeding on our crops. But at the uh, on the other hand the insects are also responsible or also important in terms of uh, doing the pollinations. So, because of their uh, important role to be play in the uh, pollination because you do not know if this particular type of insect is also taking part in the pollination of some crops and if these insects are going to be wiped off from the environment 
probably probably that particular uh, plant crop or particular plant species also going to be uh, will not be going to propagate because the you are destroying the pollinating agent and as a result of this this idea was exciting at the beginning when the people have used and tested it in USA and it has actually eradicated the uh, insects uh, which are actually destroying the cotton crops but uh, re, re, very soon people have realized that it could have a very severe side effect in terms of the that it is actually going to destroy the normal balance of different types of insects which are available in the uh, uh, environment and which are actually responsible for not only for pollination for other kinds of functions and that is why this idea did not uh, got much attention and uh, this idea was not being propagated in a larger way. Now, the second way of uh, uh, protecting our crop is uh, from the insect is that you generate the insect resistance plant. You what you can do is a genetically altered crop is produced to develop resistance against the insects. One of the approach is to genetically modify the plant which will express a toxin to kill the insects but will be safe for human consumption. Bacillus thrombogenesis or the Bt is a bacteria which is secretes a insecticidal toxin which is called as the Bt toxin. So, spraying Bt toxin was in circulation to control the insect population. With the use of genetically engineering transgenic plants are produced which expresses Bt toxin in their somatic cells. When insects feed on these plants, the toxin reaches to the stomach and causes internal bleeding to kill the insects. So, this is, this is another example where we are actually genetically modifying the plant and uh, we are actually uh, making it resistance for the insects and as a result when the insects feed on these plant, uh, they, they, the toxin reaches to the insect stomach and actually it is going to kill the insect. But the same reasoning exists here again uh, that you are actually destroying this particular insects, but you do not know if this insect also has the relevance in terms of the uh, pollination as well as the other kind of uh, uh, environmental control. For example, insects are always so be a part of the food cycle and if the, you destroy these insects, you do not know if the, you are going to affect the birds and all other organisms which are going to feed on these insects. So, as a result this idea also where you are actually generating a transgenic uh, in, uh, plant to control the insects are also not been taken up with lot of excitement and ultimately people have uh, tested this idea they could find that the, this is working perfectly fine in the fields. But because of these kind of uh, environmental as well as other kind of concerns, they have limited their usage for generating a transgenic uh, plants for this purpose. Now, the second is you are actually having controlling the herbicide control. So, you, ha you have to generate the herbicide resistance plants. Uh, you know that the weeds grow very fast and they compete for nutrients with the plants. So, the chemical herbicides are being used in agriculture to eradicate weeds from the fields. So, weeds are the non wanted small plants which are being grown within the field and they actually grow very fast because they take up the nutrition and so if the weed needs to be grow removed from the crop, the herbicide should be little or no effect on the crop and plants which means to remove these weeds what you have to do is you have to uh, uh, spray the herbicides into the agriculture field. But this herbicide should not have any effect on to the uh, your crop plants. But what happen is that herbicides are either selective towards a class of plant or non selective to kill all plant they apply to and use more often to kill all vegetation which means herbicides are either selective for a class of plants for example, the herbicide could be specific for monocots, herbicides could be specific for dicots, but or sometimes the herbicides are non-specific they are going to destroy any type of vegetations and if you use those kind of herbicides in a very large quantity it is not going to kill the weeds, 
but it also going to destroy the uh, plants as well. So, that is why there is a there is a uh, important and there is a uh, urgent requirement to generate the herbicide resistance plant so that when you spray the herbicides you it will only going to kill the weeds it is not going to affect the crop plants. The most of the so one of the popular herbicide is the glyphosate and glyphosate is one of the uh, is designed to kill the weeds it interfere with the biosynthesis of aromatic amino acid tyrosine phenylalanine and tryptophan by inhibiting the uh, EPSP that 5 5-inoil pyruvyl shikimate 3 phosphate synthase. So, uh, EPSP synthase is catalyzing a reaction where it is taking a shikimate 3 phosphate with phosphoenol pyruvate to generate the 5-inoil pyruvyl shikimate phosphate e EPSP and this product actually this particular product has a relevance in the biosynthesis of the tyrosine, uh, tip, uh, tyrosine tryptophan uh, and the phenylalanine and by inhibiting this particular enzyme this you are actually inhibiting or you are actually limiting the availability of these amino acids for biosynthesis of many of the pr uh, proteins which are actually may be responsible for running the crucial biosynthetic crucial metabolic reactions and the enzyme uh, catalyzes the conversion of this to uh, shikimate 3 phosphate 2 5 this the treated plant cannot be able to produce these any amino acid as well as the protein needed and dyes. So, what happen is when you are treating the uh, the agriculture field with the uh, glycophosate. Uh, it is actually inhibiting the EPSP synthase and as a result of this it is actually not allowing the synthesis of 5 oil pyruvyl sikimate phosphate EPSP and since the EPSP is involved in the biosynthesis of tyrosine tryptophan and phenylalanine it is actually and and the, all these these three amino acids are the essential amino acids and because of that it could not be able the, the plants could not be able to synthesize many of the essential proteins and as a result they actually die. There are two approaches uh, which people are adapted to develop herbicide resistance in crop plant. In the approach number one the genetically modified crop plant is designed with an alternate pathway to supply the aromatic amino acids to compensate the inhibition of EPSV which means the people are generating the transgenic plants where they are actually putting the alternate uh, biosynthetic pathways so that uh, the plant should not be dependent on this EPSP to, to provide the tyrosine phenylalanine and tryptophan as a result the if even if you treating it the with the, uh, the, the with the glyphosate uh, the only the weeds are going to be die the the crop plant is going to be get protected the other approach is that you few bacterial strain uses an alternate form of epsp that is resistant to the glyphosate inhibition the modified inversion of epsp gene was isolated from the agrobacterium strain cp4 and cloned into the crop plant to provide herbicide resistance. So far the crop plant commercially available with the herbicides are soya, maize, sorghum, canola and the cotton. So, the alternate approach is that one of the bacteria uh, uh, agrobacterium to uh, agrobacterium strain CP4 uh, is being used to isolate the derived version of EPSP and this derived version of EPSP is resistance for the uh, inhibition by the glyphosate and what you can do is you can take this and over express that into the uh, plant and as a result the plant is also going to be resistance against the glyphosate and uh, once you use that it is actually going to not going to be killed and it is going to work uh, as it can be able to provide the different types of uh, amino acids and it, the plant will survive at the end. So, the herbicide resistant plants are available in the form of soya, maize and all these kind of plants. The other aspect is that you want a plant which is disease free plants. So, in that case you have to generate a disease resistance plants. The disease resistance plants 
are uh, continuous exposure to the so in one of the approach what people were trying in the beginning is that plants are uh, when they are getting under the continuous exposure of pathogenic organism and the environmental conditions the pathogenic organisms such as bacteria fungi mycoplasma viruses attacks on the plant to gain nutrients for their growth and disturb its metabolism to exhibit pathological symptoms there are multiple approaches to develop disease resistance plants although in few cases it is not possible to develop a disease resistant plant at all so what are these approaches so these are the uh, selected list of disease resistance plants uh, in the case of french bean you have the uh, uh, hilda uh, which is actually resistance against the mosaic virus and the uh, anthrocinos then you have the beans you have futura which is actually resistance against the chocolate spot then you have the in the cabbage you have stone head f1 which is against the mildew then we have the carrot carrot you have the fly away f1 which is actually for the carrot fly then we have the cucumber which is uh, bush champion f1 which is the variety and that variety has the resistance against the cucumber mosaic virus then we have the p which is the ambassador and the uh, ambassador is resistance against the powder mildew or fusarium wilt then you have the potato potato is the uh, very very important uh, vegetable so you have the three varieties colleen osprey and milva and all these three are having the uh, resistance against the blight and scab scab and ilworm and the blight resistance similarly you have the resistance plant for pepper sweet corn and tomato and all these are actually the varieties which people have to develop the disease resistance uh, disease resistance plants can be uh, generated by uh, uh, following the two approaches uh, either the selection and breeding of the natural uh, re disease resistance plant species so you know that the plants are getting continuous exposure to the uh, pathogenic organisms and once they enter into the pathogenic organism they also acquire the resistance on their own which means they are also having the natural resistance so you have few species which are having the resistance against the disease the there you have few plants which are sensitive for the that particular disease so at the end what will happen is the sensitive species are going to die whereas the resistance species are going to survive so if you Uh, breed those resistance varieties uh, you could be able to get the natural um, plants natural species which are actually uh, uh, going to be resistance so in those cases you have the few naturally occurring plant species have acquired resistance against a particular disease these species are preferred over other species for production in few cases the plant species resistance to the disease are either susceptible to other disease or the yeah, their yield is low in both cases it is preferred that the disease resistance plant species can be breed can be cross breed uh, with a high yield plant species to acquire resistance as well as the high yield which so in these kind of cases what happen is sometime when the plant acquires a resistance against a particular disease either it gets susceptible for other disease or in some cases it production got very low which means the yield is going to be very low but it is going to survive that happens because it is actually producing or it is actually investing lot of energy into the uh, survival pathways instead of for the production pathway so because of that if you have such kind of situations where a plant species is resistance against a disease but its productivity is low what you can do is you can do a cross breeding with a high yielding crops and uh, with the this kind of uh, cross breeding it is going to give you the new species which is going to be disease resistance and at the other hand it is going to give you the high yield the other uh, option or other uh, approach is that the production of disease resistance plant you know that the plant have a r gene which is actually the resistance genes which produces the r protein and these virulence factors allow uh, acquiring resistance to the combat pathogen every r gene recognizes pathogen protein in a receptor ligand fashion and as a result the r gene product provides resistance against a 
particular pathogen or a family of related pathogen which means what you are saying is that every uh, resistance is mean because of the R gene and if this R gene is actually producing a R protein and this R protein is having a ligand onto the uh, pathogen and that is how it is actually giving you the resistance in that particular uh, plant. So, R gene has the ability to modify its product to acquire resistance against new species of a pathogen. A good example include barley MLO which, uh, which is against the powder MDU or the wheat LR34 which is against the leaf rust and the wheat YR360 uh, against the stripe rust. So, these are the three examples where the people have test tried uh, over expressing the R gene which is actually the resistance gene which is going to produce the corresponding protein and that corresponding protein are going to recognize the ligands which are present on the pathogen. In some cases you can actually uh, modify the R gene in such a way so that it is not going to uh, only recognizes the pathogen, but it also can recognize the other species of the pathogen so that you can actually bring the multi resistance plants and as a result uh, it is going to be resistant, uh, it will acquire the resistance against not only one disease, but also against the multiple diseases. Uh, so, irrespective of whether you follow this species approach which means selection and breeding of natural plants or whether you use the production of resistance plants, uh, both are these approaches are having the uh, uh, advantages as well as the disadvantages. This is the species where you have a disadvantage that it is very, very time consuming and many of the time it you do not know what is the mechanism through which the particular plant species has acquired the resistance. So, in those cases it sometimes it happens that when you uh, when you realize that okay, this particular plant has species has uh, resistance, it could be possible that the resistance may revert back and it becomes sensitive for the that per same the species in case you have uh, actually cross breeding this with the high yield plants and also on. Similarly, in the production of resistance protein the you are in this particular approach where you are using the production of resistance protein. Uh, the, this is a time consuming process it actually uh, first of all you also have to know that what are the genes are important for providing the resistance and then you have to take out these protein uh, genes from the uh, corresponding plants and then you have to over express into the different plants and generate the transgenic plants and all that and that is a very very challenging task to generate the transgenic plants. Irrespective of these approaches the ultimate uh, thing which going to terminate is that in both of these cases you are going to use the uh, help of other techniques such as the plant tissue culture. So, now we are going to start discussing about the plant tissue culture. So, plant tissue culture is a technique which has been evolved so that it allows you to generate the disease free and the clonal propagation of the same plants without going through the breeding cycles. Because the advantage of not going into the breeding cycle is that it is going to help you to bring the uh, uh, no variability in the uh, gen genome which means the cell line is going to be remain uh, pure throughout the process of the plant tissue culture. On the other hand there are plants which are actually facing problems in breeding through a natural process. So, those plants also can be propagated using the plant tissue culture and plant tissue culture is a is a, is a systematic way in which you take up the uh, some portion of the plant and then you develop the plantlets from there and then you take those plantlets and grow them to, uh, uh, to plants and then ultimately you can take those to the uh, fields and uh, use them for the downstream applications. So, the a typical plant tissue culture uh, protocol requires following steps. First is you are going to select the source of X plant which means either the potted plant or the plant which you can take up from the fields. Then you are going to select the X plants which means X plant could be uh, X plant could be the leaf, 
explant could be the stem or in some cases the explant could be the root. So, you can choose which part of the plant you would like to use as a explant. Then what you are going to do in the third step, you are going to do a surface sterilization of the explant. Then in the fourth step, you are going to uh, do the inoculation of the explant in the sterilized media which means in this part for this particular uh, step you are also have to prepare the media which is required for the plant tissue culture. Once you are done with the fourth then you are supposed to uh, go to the fifth step which means once the plant explant will grow you have to it, it is going to form the callus. Once the callus is formed then you have to modify the growth conditions in the step number 6 so that it is going to generate the root and shoot which is actually going to give you the plantlets and then once the plantlets are being generated then you can take up to the acclimatization steps where the plant is going to be acclimatized for the external environment because up to the step 6 these is step 6 you are doing it in a controlled lab conditions where uh, everything is under the control whereas the acclimatization steps you are going to do that into the outside which means you are going to do that into the greenhouse where the conditions are not that going to be uh, under control and you are going to acclimatize that particular plant for how to survive in a natural environment and ultimately you are going to transfer these plants to the field for the hardening so that the plant is also going to be acclimatized how it is going to uh, what are the problem it is going to face when it will go to the fields and once you are done with the hardening steps these plants are ready to be propagated into the fields and that can be they can be used in fields for further applications in the plant science. So for tissue culture uh, you require lot of different types of instruments. So, what are the instruments you require? You need a cork borer. Uh, a cork borer is a is a instrument which actually requires to cut the disc from the leaves. Uh, so, in this particular examples, we have shown how to do the plant tissue culture from the leaf. But if it is a uh, any other uh, explants like stem or leaves, uh, stems or the root, you can use the different types of uh, instruments. Then you need the forceps which are going to be uh, different types of forces either the sharp forces or the broad forces. These are the forceps which you need to pick up the plant parts. Then you need a scalpel. A scalpel is required for cutting the explants if it is a root or a stem. Then you need the petty plates, uh, petty plates to uh, keep the explants and also you need a Wattman filter paper so that you can actually dry the explant before you inoculate them into the inoculation media. Uh, so for procedure, what are the procedures are involved in a plant tissue culture? In the step number one, you have to prepare the culture media and then you have to sterilize this culture media. In the step two, you have to select the uh, these, uh, the explant and then you have to do a ster surface sterilization of the explant. Then you have to collect, uh, prepare the uh, disc from the explant. In this particular example, since we are we have taken a leaf, uh, we are preparing a disc from the leaves. Then you have to do a inoculation of these discs and form the callus. And then we have to do a incubation for the development of the root and shoot in the plantlets. So at this stage, you are going to vary the combination of the hormones in such a way so that it is going to develop the root and shoots. And then ultimately, you are going to do the acclimatization as well as the hardening steps. So let's start with the first step. So in the first step, you are going to do a preparation of the culture media. The Preparation of a plant tissue culture media requires many components such as it requires the MS media which is called Murashimi media or MS media that MS media and then you MS media requires the major salt or the minor salts. So the minor salt requires like uh, uh, ferrous sulphate or sodium acetate. And uh, minor salts, minor salts are required such as the Ki, borate, manganese, zinc, um, molybdenum, copper, and cobalt. And 
the major salt what is required is the ammonium nitrate, potassium nitrate, uh, calcium chloride, uh, magnesium sulphate and hydrogen phosphate. You need a carbon source, so in this case uh, people are normally using the sucrose as a carbon source. Uh, once you prepare the MS media then you can have the you can put a, a gelling, gelling agent and as a result the MS media is going to be form a thick layer. Uh, this is the uh, once you culture you have prepared the culture media it requires the sterilization. So, sterilization can be done uh, if you remember we have already discussed about the sterilization in a in a, our one of the demo videos. So, you can use the similar kind of procedures to sterilize the media. Uh, the only difference is that you do not have to add the sucrose while you are doing the sterilization you can add the sucrose later on in a uh, aseptic conditions and you can do uh, autoclaving at 120 degrees Celsius for uh, and 15 pascals uh, and once the culture media is prepared you, you can see that the culture media will solidify to give you a slant. So, it is going to be like, uh, like this. So, that actually if you prepare a slanting media it actually going to give you large surface area for inoculations. Once your media is prepared then you can use uh, selection and the uh, surface sterilization. So, in this particular example we have taken leaf as an explant. You can do a surface sterilization of the explant. So, what you can do is first wash the leaves with the twin 20. Once you are done with the washing with the twin 20. So, twin 20 is a, is a detergent. So, that twin 20 is going to destroy the microorganism. Uh, so, the purpose of sterilization is that you do not want the microorganism to grow while you are generating the plants. So, you, gen you wash the uh, plants with the explant with the 2 in 20 and you once you are done with the 2 in 20 then you wash using the sterilized uh, distilled water. After the 2 in 20 you sterilize again with a 70 percent ethanol using 70 percent ethanol. Uh, once the uh, and the 70 percent ethanol is also being done only for the purpose that it is going to destroy the microorganisms and then you wash using the sterile distilled water and ultimately you are going to sterilize the explant with the help of the mercury chloride. The mercury chloride is a poison so it is going to kill the microorganism but since the mercury chloride is poisonous in nature it has to be handled uh, very carefully. And uh, then ultimately you wash the uh, uh, explant with the sterile distilled water and that actually is going to make the surface of the explant very sterile. So, that now it is free of microorganisms. So, you can use that for uh, uh, tissue culture. After that you have to use the borer and with the help of the borer you can actually make the disc. So, you can see that a lot of disc we have cut it from the leaves. Now, you take these one of these disc and uh, so these are the export disc what we have prepared and in the next step you have to do an inoculation and callus formation. So, what you have to do is uh, with the help of the sterile forceps you can take one of the these disc and put it into the uh, into the culture media or inoculate that into explant into the explant disc into the media. And uh, once you inoculate you have to leave it and after inoculation you have to leave it for the uh, uh, for few weeks and with in this period what will happen is that inoculated media uh, inoculated disc will take up the nutrition from the media and it will grow and ultimately with the help of the combination of the hormones it is going to give you a probable uh, callus. This callus now can be differentiated with the help of the uh, different types of hormones which are responsible for generating the shoots as well as the root and uh, that actually will give you the plantlets. Now, once you do that the plant is going to generate the shoot on the top and the root at the bottom and now this plant is good enough to transfer it to the uh, greenhouse for acclimatization. So, the next step is that you uh, uh, do the acclimatization as well as the hardening of these plants. So, 
you thoroughly uh, wash the plantlets and put out into the low mineral salt media for 24 to 48 hours that and then the plantlets are transferred to a pot and wrap with a porous polythene for 15 to 30 days. Since you are making it, uh, covering it into a porous polythene bags that usually allow the entry and exit of the uh, gases, but it will not al allow the entry of microorganisms. So, the plant will still be under the control conditions, but it can actually get acclimatized to the environmental conditions. And then if you keep them for uh, 15 to 30 days, they will get acclimatized for the external environment and then what you can do is you can transfer the acclimatized plant to the large plot or to the field. And once you uh, transfer them to the large plot, they will get uh, not only acclimatized for the environmental condition, they will also get acclimatized for the microorganism as well. And then once you are sure that they are surviving uh, in the pot, then you can transfer them into the fields for other kind of downstream applications related to the plant tissue culture. Uh, why we are doing this uh, plant tissue culture? Because uh, the inability to produce seeds, because we are doing it for the plant which are inable to uh, produce the seeds. Uh, or if they are producing the uh, less number of viable seeds or they are, they are even if they are sometimes they are producing the seeds, but they are uh, their, their seeds are very uh, poorly viable or you do not want the uh, mixing of traits which means you want the pure cell lines or pure lines which means you do not want a mixing of the genetic material. Lastly, you want the disease free plants because the plants what you are going to grow into the plant tissue culture technique are going to be disease free and ultimately the plant tissue culture can give you a unlimited number of plant with a short time frame. With this we would like to conclude our lecture here. In our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the role of genetic engineering in the animal sciences as well as in the fisheries and as well as the other other areas thank you